So, well, well, thank you so much for spending some time out of your day to do this, to have a conversation. Yeah, no worries. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I, I, it's, it's really interesting because I get really inspired, but at the same time, uh, I'm also, I suppose, the, suppose a bit of a fatalist. So when I get inspired, when I see people, you know, you know, doing the good work of, you know, fighting for the climate, for human rights, for animal rights. But, you know, I think even before we start, like, really discussing all of this in, uh, in, a little deeper perhaps i can also understand like was there something you've always had in you or was there something that kind of sparked this this side of you um i think it's 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 always been a part of my nature um i mean as a kid i was always rescuing something i was always bringing home some random animal you know i would rescue my neighbor's pets even though they didn't need <laughs> Um, you know, I, I was always bring, always bringing home straits, you know, and I, as a kid, I wanted to be a paramedic. I wanted to be a vet. I wanted to be a marine biologist. So it was always something to do with rescuing. It was something to do with um, the planet and animals and, and things like that. So I guess it's just something that I was born with. Um, it helped that my mom was... Um, you know, she really thought in that way as well, in, in the sense that she always thought in a way that was like thinking about the environment. She, um, I grew up with her talking about living off the grid, being self-sustainable, growing her own veggies, composting, um, all of those those things before I even understand understood what she was um, talking about or what her motivations were. And she she also spoke about rescuing orangutans when she lived in Indonesia and things like that. So. Um, yeah, it's 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 been there for as long as I can remember. Um, so, yeah. and and then as uh, being a mom, it's kind of like I have no choice. You know, there's there's no choice but to to do this work. So, yeah. Yeah, I suppose that responsibility compounds when when you're bringing someone into this world and they inherit what we've kind of created but the, the mess that we yes <laughs> the mess that we've created yeah and i suppose i suppose that's the thing that most of us kind of struggle with right because you know we've you know as as a society i think we're we're not ignorant to it i think we're really aware of the challenges and the problems and all the issues that we face but i think you know just understanding the magnitude of it and, you know, our ability to really move the needle can sometimes be a bit challenging. Mm -hmm. So I suppose, like, what I'm interested in, especially with you being an, a UN Environment Program Ambassador, is, you know, would you say you're optimistic about the, the, our current way forward and, you know, how we are trying to tackle these issues? You know, um, in my role as a UN Environment Goodwill Ambassador um, and in my role as environmental advocate, um, I mean, the business is selling hope, right? Um, otherwise, there is no role. Uh, but, you know, to be honest with you, it's, it's, it's getting harder and harder to have that optimism. Um, and that optimism, I guess, is what's kept me going for for so many decades, right? I mean, I first started speaking about conservation and sustainability in 1996. Um, so I've been at this a really, really long time. Um, but increasingly, it's it's very, very hard because as time goes by and as those deadlines come and go and as those commitments continue not to be met, um, it's it's very hard. Uh, especially when you know what the science is around the state of our planet um, and around the different planetary systems, around the different sort of systems that are already collapsing. Um, hope hope um, becomes harder and harder to find, right? Um, so increasingly, uh, I find myself focusing on shifting, shifting the kind of, the intention or the motivation from we need to save the planet so that we can survive as a humanity here because without a balanced 
um, ecosystem and rich biodiversity, you know, humanity really can't survive. So my, my, my fight to, to fight for the environment is really <laughs> for our ability to survive here on this planet, right? Um, but increasingly, it's, it's, it's like we need to have a balanced approach because um, two things. One is the reality is we're headed down a pretty slippery slope already. Uh, and COVID is just the tipping point. And COVID, we have to remember, is a, is a direct result of our, our engagement with the environment and wildlife. Um, so it's it's like, okay, we are headed in this direction. So what can we do about it if we can't pull back right now? We have to give ourselves the tools for our inner reality to be able to deal with the outer reality, uh, regardless of what's going on, because it's going to get harder and harder. So we need the tools within our mind to be able to cope. Um, so it's it's really about radical self care as we as we continue to progress um, with all of the challenges that we're facing as a global community. Uh, so, what does uh, not to cut you off, but what yeah. does radical self care really mean? Well, it, it, it's 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 um, it's not just self care of the body, but it's care of the mind, uh, and it's it's an understanding that our outer reality can be shaped with our, from our inner reality, right? So, if you gave one person, two people, two two people the same um, incident, depending on their perspectives, they'll be able to process that differently, right? So, if we have the tools in our mind um, to be able to um, adjust our perspectives uh, and um, shape the way that we cope and manage with our outer reality. That is, is to me, is radical self care because you know if we we work out our bodies um, and because it's a muscle. And if our bodies are injured, we go and see um, somebody who might be able to help us with that injured muscle. Right? We go and. Um, you know, we do rehab, we will treat it with, you know, anti-inflammatories or rub a salve on it, you know, and the same can be said of the mind. And we need to remember that, right? And, and as we move further and further, even through COVID, even over the next um, five years, UN says suicide rates will increase 25%. That's a lot, right? And that's something that nobody's really talking about. So we need to be able to look after our minds, uh, and to come together as a community to deal with these things um, uh, with with a sense of, of of togetherness as opposed to you know, us and them and and, and increased um, uh, separation that's, that's occurring right so it's really about those things <clears throat> yeah I mean and and that's what I've noticed you know in 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 the work that you do you tend to to speak a lot about, you know, having the us, uh, not having the us versus them mindset and, you know, being united. Like, what's a good example of that, you know, in in, in the current context? You know, I, I, I suppose I can think of a few in terms of COVID and rallying people, but, you know, is there something that, you know, sticks out in your mind? <clears throat> something that sticks out in my mind. Um... Well, you know, with 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 We the Good, which is a platform that I launched for, um, in, which was was initiated during COVID, and it's um, it really is to shine a light on the it really is to shine a light on the um, We the Good is is really to shine a light on the underserved charities in Singapore uh, and using platform of influence to try and create impact, uh, and it, it to me it really really was. A, is a platform for collaboration. Um, that's my my hope. So I hope to bring in people from from all walks of life with varying levels of of um, influence and um, knowledge and wisdom to be able to help those who need it most. So that that is that's one example of, of something that I'm trying to create, which is a collaborative platform. Um, I think you know, I do think that collectively we're feeling that. I don't know. 
I, I do feel that the younger generation are much more socially engaged. Um, just look at the, the recent elections in Singapore. People do want change. Do they have the tools? Do they know what the goalposts are? The goalposts are constantly shifting um, and, and there's so much uncertainty. So I think the most important thing really is those basic human traits yeah. that that can't, you know, if we, if we really develop them, they can't be so dramatically affected by outside circumstances, you know, um, community, kindness, mindfulness, um, you know, understanding of our own emotions and how to deal with them, um, which is self-curiosity, uh, education for kids, um, yeah, looking out for your buddies, listening into them and understanding how they're actually doing. You know, those are the sort of, the, the, the sort of human traits that we need to work on um, more yeah. and more. Yeah, I suppose, and, and that's a good point you brought up about you know, like the the younger generation or yeah, even even, well, I don't think just the younger generation, but as Singaporeans and even globally, like people are more galvanized towards wanting change, and I I, I find that the us versus them mindset um, really stems around people being too critical about people who want change but don't have the answers. You know, and they're like, oh, you don't have the answer. Why are you shouting foul or crying foul? And I don't know, like it for me, I think that's really counterproductive. And, and that's one of the reasons why I suppose you started like We The Good, I mean, um, among uh, other things. But if let's say we use We The Good as an example, like how do we, how do these types of conversations do you think can help change a mindset for those who maybe are pessimistic, critical, or maybe just they don't even know. Mm. Yeah, you know, it's really, it, it's a great question um, because as, as somebody who's trying to shift hearts and minds, right, because you have to tell stories to shift hearts and minds, hearts and minds, sh you know, shift behavior, behaviors, consumer behavior shifts, you know, corporate behavior, that kind of thing. Um, and it's really sort of understanding the behavioral change science, right? And this is something that I've, I've been thinking about for a long time. Um, so about 10 years ago, I was thinking to myself, how do we get people to care about the environment, orangutans, elephants, um, climate change when they don't care about themselves? Right. Right. Um, and how do we get people to care about themselves um, when they don't have those tools, right? And if you are not well within stable and, and robust, there's no way you can even start thinking about climate change because that's just overwhelming. And that, you know, there's the whole thing around having eco anxiety and all of those things, right? So to be a part of change, you need to be well yourself. Right. You can't change your family, your community or, you know, even looking at sort of global global challenges unless you're ready to take that on. And you need to be well to do that because it's stressful and it's depressing um, and it's it, it really does feel hopeless at times. Right. So it's it's, you know, moving forward. Um, anyone who wants to influence change, I say, please dedicate at least 20% of your time to your own well-being, right? But yeah. with the motivation to serve, right? Yeah. Impossible to do so otherwise. I mean, I hit a wall in 2018 and it was really challenging. Um, so I, I really do believe that everyone really needs to invest in, in, in their well-being to, be to, to be able to deal with where we're headed. Yeah. What, what was that wall like for you? And how did you, I don't know, climb over it or run through it yeah so i 2018 i think it was i helped the united Nations launch their global environment outlook which was the um latest document with the latest science on the state of the planet and that was in at the united nations um, environment assembly in nairobi on stage with the world's top scientists. And, um, you know, it, it, you hear this, you know, when people say we've got seven years or we've got 12 years or whatever, whatever to turn things on, we don't. We have, we had then, um, they were saying a year to turn things around, realistically, right? And this document, Global Environment Outlook, is like, how many inches is this? Like, it's, it's, it's like a, 
an old fashioned phone book times however many, so it's like at least three inches thick, right? Oh, wow. Alternate scientific data. Who's going to read it? Who's going exactly. to understand it? You know, and who are the people telling these stories, right? So I sat there on stage with these scientists and their mood was, was desperately bleak. Um, and it was like, well, how is this, how is this going to happen? Who's going to read this, right? And then after that, not long after that, I read um, a book called uh, The Uninhabitable Earth by David Wallace Wells. Uh, and in that book, he goes through all of the different planetary systems uh, and um, where we're at with each of those systems, whether it's ice melt, water, pollution, plastics, climate change, um, you know, soil, all of those things. Um, acidification and uh, that too was 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 terribly depressing and all um, backed by science and all of the references for all of the, the papers and the documents um, were in the back of the book. So it was not somebody hypothesizing, it was all really um, science-based. So when I when those two things happened, I was like, oh, what have I been doing with my life, <laughs> you know, for the last 20-odd um, years, right? Like how I haven't even made a dent in where we've headed with, you know, as a global community. Um, so I, have I just been wasting my time and what's the point, right? So that really hit me. That was just like, wow, <laughs> oh, man, you know, and... I I almost gave up. Um, I I had a lot of anxiety um, and was was kind of you know hit into into depression and um, had to take a lot of time to try and work it out in my head. Um, and one of the thoughts that came up was, if I stop now, what what do I tell my kids? You know, if I if I um, give up, what do I tell them? Like, how do I tell them I've I've, I've given up on their future? Right, um, and how could I lay down at night with a clear conscience? And I couldn't. Um, and then um, I I was very fortunate to um, have a private audience with His Holiness the Dalai Lama, and you know he he knew he knew what I did. And, and then I sat down, I kneeled down in front of him, and he said. Education is so important when it comes to the environment. So important. We monks, we don't have children. And then he slapped me on the head. You know? <laughs> we monks, we don't have children. Then slap me on the head. You, you have children. And it was like his playful kind of like, you know, slap on the head, right? Yeah. And then he said, so important the work that you're doing. Must, must, you must do this right. And he slapped me across the head, <laughs> you know, on the cheek, right? So I was like, well... Okay, then that's clear. I, I guess I can't give up on that on this work, right? Um, and so then I carry on. But uh, as I say, it's it's a balance. And for me, um, I'm involved with an org organization called the Contentment Foundation, which um, is um, I think one of the world's top social emotional learning curriculums, um, which is currently rolling out to ten countries across the world. Uh, across to 50 schools in Bhutan, and that will help them to achieve their gross national happiness mandate. Um, and then we just had some exciting news about being picked up by a global education provider. Um, and Contentment Foundation for me ticks two boxes. Uh, one is that um, it gives kids the tools to be able to move from a place of apathy to a place of empathy, right? The second is it gives kids the tools to be able to deal with the crap that we've left. Right. So those things, the, the, the tools of well-being, radical well-being, um, are not disconnected from my work as an environmentalist. Um, they are directly related because right now that's where we are. We need to, we just need to look out for ourselves. Um, so, so the education portion and the environment portion um, uh, are, are working beautifully hand in hand. Um, and, yeah, it helps me to fulfill that, that aspect of, of giving kids the tools to be able to deal with where we're yeah. headed. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Um, is it, it, it's called Contentment? Yes, the Contentment Foundation. Yeah. Well, that's an, that's an interesting name. Was it, was it named Contentment? Uh, is that under the idea that, you know, learning how to be contented with, I mean, who we are and the place that we are in, or was that, is yeah. that one of the reasons? Yeah, pretty much. I, I, can, I can send you um, an article in the Washington Post that yeah, the, um, Dr. Daniel Cordaro wrote about 
you know, contentment versus happiness. Um, and uh, Contentment Foundation was set up by a guy named Dr. Daniel Cordaro, who was the director of the Yale Center for Wellbeing. I think he was the youngest ever lecturer at Yale, at Yale lecturer, tenured lecturer at Yale University. Yeah. Um, and he's one of the foremost uh, professors, on, professors on human emotions. Um, incredible, incredible human being. Um, and so he, what, what he's done is, is he's married some of the world's um, ancient philosophies with uh, the most modern neuroscience. And the curriculum is, um, is, is very data and analytics um, supported. Uh, and it's, it's, it's beautiful because it's all members of the school community uh, are encouraged to, or will do, um, go through the curriculum. The teachers have to be well first. The teachers actually have to get, you know, have to go through the training so that they're well enough to be able to develop, develop the curriculum. I mean, deliver the curriculum to the kids, which is something that is, is, I think, so precious because teachers these days are so, I mean, look at Singapore, right? The teachers are undervalued, overstressed. You know, overworked under so much pressure um, to 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 um, to achieve and get the kids to achieve, right? So, how can we expect that they would be able to read or understand what well well being is and be able to support their kids in that, right? So, we have to give the teachers these tools first. So, the curriculum um, Contemporary Foundation does that. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. I'm. I'm... Uh, I feel like it should be more popular than than it is. You know, it's not, it's, or at least, or maybe I'm just not haven't been reading enough of the news. I I'm I'm curious when when you work for for organizations like this and you see people really dedicated to the cause, what inspires you about their work? You know, because you I you you were speaking before about you know them being very bleak at the UN Council and. Uh, but yet they do what they do, and you know I'm curious what you've learned from how they inspire themselves or keep them motivated. Mm. Uh, do you mean yeah it, within the contemporary foundation or within the environmental sort of advocacy space? I, I think in general uh, for like these types of organizations, right? You, it's it always feels like it's a uh, it's an uphill battle, you know, mm. because to change minds require. You know, at the very least, half a generation, or you, if we're mm. lucky, right? So, mm. you know, when when things require such, or, or when things are time sensitive, like you know, the climate and educating people to be mentally prepared for that and the world that is to come, like how how do they keep themselves motivated and inspired? You, you spoke about yours, but I'm curious what you've learned from you know your your peers. Mm. I think um, for, for you, you know, to be very honest with you, for my peers in, in the environmental advocacy space or working in sustainability um, or conservation, they are, um, a lot of the time, exhausted, overwhelmed, underfunded, um, disenchanted, and, and grumpy. <laughs> Grumpy. You know? yeah. Very relatable. <laughs> it, it's just it's just how it is, right? I mean, also, I mean, look at COVID right now. The world is where is the money for conservation going? Gone. It's completely gone, right? Where does the money from conservation usually come from? Tourism. Where have the tourists gone? Completely gone, right? So tourism dollars are gone, conservation money is gone, um, you know, poaching increases, you know, all, all of these things. So right, so it's challenging, right? So that's why I say it's really important if you are wanting to be a change maker that you have a personal well-being practice, right? So for those who don't, um, I do see that there is a great deal of fatigue. Yeah. Um, for my community within the well-being um, space um, who are also passionate about um, our planet, <clears throat> passionate about our planet and our ability to survive here um, and thrive, it's really because they are focused primarily on building a robust, well, thriving community of individuals who are healthy of mind and healthy of body that they then can create impact. Right. So you can see how you can see how the two different communities um, are. Right. It's and 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 it really it's I know it's such a cliche. But it has to start with the self. 
Right. Right. It really has to start with itself. But the, at the moment, because time is critical, you've got to have all of these things running in parallel. Right. So for me, I still talk about conservation. I still talk about sustainability. But at the same time, I'm talking about well-being. Right. Because they have to go hand in hand. Um, so the approach, the approach needs to shift a little so that people can tahan and, and <laughs> continue to do the work. Right. Yeah. Uh, without being overwhelmed. Yeah, I, I I like to share a story about it as well. Um, so uh, I had a friend who was a vet in Tanzania in the Serengeti, and I went to visit him. And so he, as a vet, you travel with a guide slash security, you know, because whenever you take care of animals and there are poachers around, they they usually take out the vet first, you know, so that you can't save the animal. And his 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 guard was was telling me this incredible story because when he was young he used to be a poacher he was nine years old and you know he did it out of money and and one day uh, the park rangers caught him and his group of people um, and the park ranger um, had them all kneel down all five or six of them and he. In, in ranging from the oldest to the youngest, and he asked the oldest guy, he's like, "Why do you? Why are you a poacher?" And then the the poacher said, "You know, I, I want to feed my family." And the the guard the guard shot him, and it cascaded down. Yeah, it cascaded down all the way to the last one, and it was him. And he said, "Why do you want to? Why do you want to be a poacher?" And he said, "I don't know." You know, and they. They took him. They took him to essentially, you know, back to his family. But eventually, he joined these guards. And very. And later, when he graduated, he asked. He asked that same guy. He's like, "Why did you shoot my friends?" You know, and he said, "Honestly, I'm I'm tired of fighting. You know, and I don't want to have to see their faces again. So let you know, I and I hope that I can just send a message this way." And uh, and his instructor asked him, "Why did why do you why did you choose to come back and join the guards? You know, if, after I spared your life." And he said, "I don't think I can take the stress of feeling like I would get shot." Mm -hmm. And I and I think it's it, it, the reason why it, I remember this story again is because for him that he couldn't take that mental anxiety of always looking over his shoulder, you know, and. For him, he's like, yeah, the money is good, but is it worth the stress and you know, and having to wonder if my family is gonna be part of this war and, and stuff like that? And I, till this day, I remember this story because it it's it's part helplessness, but also part optimistic because he believes that he could have he could have done any other job but he chose to come he chose to come back as a park ranger because he felt like you know he was responsible for it and he believes like he can be part of the change so yeah i don't know why i shared that story with you but <laughs> i just it just came to mind yeah just gonna let the plane go first yeah no worries i can't hear the plane by the way Okay. Yeah. Sometimes it, get, it comes and it gets quite loud. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, that's a that's a powerful story. Um, and, um, you know, one thing that um, a lot of the time that people aren't aware of when it comes to illegal wildlife trade is that on one side it is really driven by poverty uh, and on the other side it's driven by um, greed and ego and excess, right? Um, you know, in some places... In that Tanzania, Kenya sort of um, border area, um, Amboseli region, where this is the home of the elephants, right? Um, you know, I met someone when I was in Africa filming my documentary, uh, Let Elephants Be Elephants, that went to air on National Geographic. Um, I, I, met, um, I met a guy who, whose father had five wives and he had 30-something siblings. Right, um, but of those thirty-something siblings, I believe only eight were left uh, because they, the rest had died, mostly of AIDS. Um, and so, you know, when if you, for example, were a, a farmer and in a polygamous society, whereas it is acceptable to have five wives, you have thirty-something kids, 
and you see an elephant walking across the road, right? And then you see that the, the, they call it the China Road, this massive Belt and Road project, which is running through Kenya. And, and you've, you've got the Chinese engineers there and it's very easy to kill the elephant, hand over the ivory, you feed your kids. Right. You know, um, so it is, it's, it's like, it, what has to happen is that and the most successful conservation programs that I've seen are the ones who focus um, almost half of their efforts or even more on supporting the local community, right? So you can't go in and say, I'm here to save elephants or orangutans and the people around here, you can, you know, whatever, we don't really care, right? But if you invest in that community, right, and you make that your primary work, then the elephants or the orangutans or the animals in that, that area will also benefit because you, because of the investment you put in the community, you have extra eyes and ears on the ground, right? They are the people of the land. They know when somebody has been through their territory. They know when there's been a camp set up overnight. They know when there are footprints on the ground. And so then they become this extra uh, uh, additional um, um, team on your side. Um, and that, to me, is, is, has been, you know, the, the programs that have the most success. Conservation, uh, you know, directly related to um, uh, the work with the community. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's not straightforward. Um, yeah. And sometimes it's a, it's a much slower way, but it, it absolutely has to be done. Yeah. And when you draw that back to the context of Singapore and maybe the work that you do for We The Good, do you see that same type of result? Because you, you speak about investing in underserved charities and communities do you see that same type of result when you invest in the under underserved and underrepresented um which is new you know um so and and we set up in such a way that it was quite a sort of like okay we're going to do this right and now yeah. we're pulling back and, and being a little bit more kind of strategic about what we're doing you know for the first few months we've been really focusing on i guess we're focusing we focus where the need is needed most so for the first few months it was um the guest worker community and what we were doing we were focused on the mental well-being of the guest workers uh because it's it's underreported but you know on a, almost on a daily basis there are attempt suicides or suicides within the dorms yeah uh, and and some of the guys until today are locked down in their rooms not even in their dorms but in their rooms you know um and you know some are not being paid you know and with it ironically, with more access to phones and communications and speaking to their families back home, that adds even more stress. You, you know, we don't think about it that way, but these guys, right, you know, um, maybe before they didn't have Wi-Fi or SIM cards, maybe they would call their loved ones once a week or once a month or whatever it is. But now it's on a daily basis of sitting there, you know, they're doing this video call all day, every day. Back home, it's even more unsafe for their family. Right, whether it's India, Bangladesh, you know, Burma, right, Myanmar, the the COVID cases are, are starting to sort of, you know, get out of control. There is not, you know, and some maybe relatives are dying. They can't leave. They're not getting paid. so the stress levels are are, are going through the roof. Um, so what we've been doing is, is bringing together various stakeholders um, across different segments of the guest worker community, whether it is the Singapore Contractors Association, where we help to partner them with a, a nonprofit who is giving them training to understand the signs of well-being, to understand signs of distress, to, uh, to know how to speak and how to listen to the guest workers. And this is the employers, you know, the main con, subcons, engineers, for whom this language would not even be on their rad radar, you know, talking about mental well-being, right? Um, and so that's sort of in process already. Then we have um, Contentment Foundation also helping to provide the tools of, of well-being to the guys in the dorm. Uh, to create well-being ambassadors within the dorm. So effectively what we're doing is we're creating a few layers of um, well-being support. So previously it was a guy in a dorm, a guy on a ledge, a guy in a dorm or a guy in a, in a coffin or in a morgue, right? So now it's a guy in the dorm who's got a buddy who's a well-being um, you know, ambassador or what, that's what we're working to, who can look out for him, eyes and ears, he's not eating well, he's not doing well, he doesn't want to you know, talk or engage, how can I support him? You know, start from the first signs of, of, of distress, you know, how can I support? And he's got the tools, right? And you know, different activities that can be run. And the next is with the, with their employers, right? 
Um, so we're trying to build these layers of well-being um, through different partnerships. So those partnerships are up and running now um, and still some, you know, obviously some support needed there here and there. But now what we're doing is we're shifting our focus to the overall community within Singapore, um, you know, pre-COVID um, stress and mental health related issues cost the country $1.3 billion a year. That's a lot of money for a small population. It's a lot of money for something that nobody talks about, right? Um, and with, with COVID, obviously, you know, the, the, the triggers are, you know, heavily compounded and um, there are so many reasons why people uh, are feeling pressure and stress and unease and uncertainty right now. Um, and so we need to help destigmatize conversations around mental well-being, um, give people the tools uh, to, to be well, um, uh, help normalize conversations around these things. And so that's what we're hoping to do um, over the next few months with We The Good. So like I said, we're still new. Uh, so we haven't yet seen the impact of, of the stuff that we've done. Um, it is a, a sort of long, long game. Uh, and we haven't even really started focusing on our third pillar, which is individuals and families at risk, you know. So it's kind of like, wow, it's a ray. <laughs> it's a yeah. ray. Sometimes it gets a bit overwhelming. Um, sometimes I feel like, oh, I was walking the other day and I was like, oh, what have I done? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel like based on everything you said, you really like to take those like more like those monumental tasks that you know that you know take a lifetime almost to to solve so really hats off to you and and i mean being new i think is a beautiful thing because you know there's this when usually the best ideas flow because you're not bogged down by the the you know for it being you know five years in and you know all these like red tapes and and maybe just um just being tired of the the process, so I think I think this is a good position to be. Um, I I actually was the uh, uh, national mental health ambassador for uh, NCSS uh, a while back, twenty seventeen, I want to say. And I think you, what you said is right. Like, um, um, and 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 I also had um, you know, slightly over a decade worth of a. Uh, uh, experiencing clinical depression so i can understand the the stigma part but i think what was at least in my experience what was slightly more important was um appreciating the relationships during this period because i think a lot of people want to help but don't know how and you know one of one of the most challenging things that we when we are going through mental health challenges is that expectation that like you know, why aren't you helping me? You know, and, and you know, there's, there's kind of like that disconnect because sometimes we forget that, you know, it's hard for people to help if they cannot yet understand. And I, I always firmly believe that, you know, a good starting point is always the people who, well, number one, can empathize, but number one, who goes, who's also been in your shoes. And, and, and when you speak about guest workers, um, uh, in my day job, uh, I do I do work with uh, some guest workers as, as well, and they said the biggest thing COVID has done was when they when they isolate you, they take away all the friends in your dorm, and that is the hardest part because everyone looks after each other, but when you're alone, there's no one you can turn to, and then every so often, some health officer checks checks on you like that's going to solve the problem. So I think. Right. In reality, the people closest to you are the ones who, I mean, who are the ones that we should be focusing like resources on because the people closest to you ha have the ability to help you best. Yeah, and and so that's um that that's perfect, you know, because it leads me into something else that we're doing with <laughs> good, um, nice. and it's, it's directly related to that because. You know, a lot of the time within our Asian communities, we have the um, that challenge of families not communicating, right? Um, and it should be 
your mom or your dad that you can talk to, or it should be your brother or your sister that you can talk to. But a lot of the time, you know, within Asian communities, it's like, if you have a problem, it's like, ah, yeah, nothing, la. it's okay, la. you'll be fine, la. nothing wrong with you, why? you just go to school, it's okay, la. nothing, you're not sad, it's okay, don't be sad, don't be sad, don't cry. It's, it's a total shutdown of, of validating your emotions or how you're feeling, right? But these feelings, they are valid. We are human being. And by nature, we have like a whole spectrum of feelings and emotions that we feel, right? And more often than not, if you acknowledge, I'm feeling sad. And if somebody says, I'm sorry that you're feeling sad, how can I support you? Most of the time, the sadness goes away because it's shared, it's let go of, and you feel supported, right? But when it's like not acknowledged, just like, Oh, what do I do? And, and, and these things, they just, they don't go away, right? And if you've had some, some kind of trauma, emotional trauma, just like I was saying earlier, physical trauma, we go to the doctor, emotional trauma, how come it gets buried, right? Yeah. So this, this intergenerational lack of communication is something that it's, it's massive within our community, right? So one of the things that we're, we're planning with We The Good is this intergenerational um, podcast, uh, talking about um, uh, uh, the mental well-being in the time of change. And, and, and uh, it's probably not too early to talk about this just now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> started production yet. But just because, you know, you're, you're sharing about that, I think it's, it's so important um, to be able to support the community uh, with these tools, um, give language to or listening tools to you know parents um so that they it's simple things that they may not even know how to do that can just be the key to changing the relationship with a child right uh, and and vice versa so i mean the younger generation these days they've got so much uh, i mean I was speaking to someone the other day and they're like, well, you know, when I, when I was a kid, we didn't have to have coaches or therapists or whatever, you know, like, and I'm like, yeah, but kids these days, look at the world that they're growing up in. It's, it's, there's very little hope for them. What, what do they have to hope for and look forward to when the world is collapsing, right? So it's very different. And, and like I said earlier, the benchmarks, the goalposts keep shifting. If you're, if you're a graduate of 2020, are you even going to college right now? If you do go to college, is what you're learning useful for, for the sure. current world that we're in? You know, it's just not how, how life used to be, right? So um, I think um, uh, parents and, and older generations need to help, need a little bit of support in understanding that. Uh, and so I'm, I'm really excited about this intergenerational podcast. Um, which will be facilitated by a professional um, yeah. to help these conversations move along. That's fantastic. Yeah, I can't wait to hear it and share it. I think it's so important. Um, yeah, I was actually thinking of, uh, I mean, well, not thinking, um, I'm actually going to have my mom on the podcast, on, on my podcast to really talk about her experience because there's a lot of airtime given to my story, but I think there's really not a lot of, given to the people closest to you, uh, you know, my wife, my, uh, uh, my mom, like they probably suffered as well. well. I mean, maybe suffered feels like a, a big word, but I think so. Um, and, and I think it really helps for people to hear their story so that they can understand what that process was like and how they should approach it and also protect themselves, you know, from, the challenges that come with, with, with that. So I'm really, I'm, I'm really glad you're doing something like that. Uh, I would love to. Can I, can you be a guest? It's anonymous so that yeah. um, parents feel comfortable coming on. Yeah. Um, so if you, I would love to have you and your mom on our podcast, if you'd be open to that. Yeah, I mean, I would be, but I'll have to ask my mom, you know, because uh, she, you know, she's not one who likes the public eye. But if, if it's, if it's audio, I, I don't, yeah, we'll we'll see. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, it's audio and anonymous, so oh, yeah, perfect. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I would love that. You know, I think it also gives us some closure. You know, I'm eternally grateful for everything that you know my family has done, but at the same time, I've never really understood what their 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 process was like. So I think that will be a good nice. cathartic experience. Nice, nice, nice. Okay, yeah. yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm excited for this podcast. I think it's, it's really important. Um, 
uh, moving back to you before we kind of close, I mean, what are you doing to keep sane and, uh, you know, in these like crazy and uncertain times? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I have a pretty, um, pretty tight routine in my mornings. Uh, you know, every morning I will do pretty much the same thing. I will get up and I'll write. I'll have my, my morning sort of fuel. I fast until lunch. Um, but my morning is, you know, I have a, a cacao drink with oat milk and um, maca powder and MCT oil and, and lion's mane mushrooms and, and, and um, all, all kinds of things sort of in there and maca powder sort of really to boost me up so I can, I can have the energy for the, for the day. And then um, I will do, you know, at least 10 minutes of movement ideally five to 10 minutes of breath work. And then I have my own um, practice that I do, my own private practice that I do. So I generally try not to take anything in the mornings before 10. Um, and I, I make sure that I set my, fun, my, my foundation steady uh, every morning. And so some people it's like, oh, I don't have time. And I have five minutes to do this or 10 minutes. I have, there's no time. I'm rushing in the morning. But I can guarantee you, you get so much more done Have out that time for yourself in the morning, right? And it's, it's something that I call smart selfish because if you invest in yourself with the motivation to serve, like I mentioned earlier, then everything else runs smoothly. You're a better parent, partner, you know, and, and uh, in, in work also, right, in your community. Um, so I, I'm very particular about trying to maintain that. Um, and I always say busy is good, but balanced is better. Um, I like that. Yeah, and I think We The Good has been a beautiful gift uh, for me uh, because through this, I get more involved with the local community in Singapore. A lot of the work that I did before was on a global scale um, and, and, you know, because conservation and, and sustainability stuff is not that, there's not that much in Singapore <laughs> work yep, yep. to do. Um, <laughs> So it's been really nice to sort of pivot, using this time to pivot and focus on um, the underserved organizations in Singapore, understanding what's happening on the ground here. And that brings a great sense of perspective and a great sense of purpose, which is something that is so beautiful. Um, and, I, and I always say, this is like, I wish I could wrap this up in a gift box and give it to people, give this feeling of, of purpose and perspective to people when they are feeling um, useless because all you need to do is start focusing on the problems and solutions that you can provide and ways you can support others who are in in maybe in a less um, a lesser privileged situation than you and your own problems tend to go away yeah. um and so this is something that's been i'm super grateful for you know even if we don't make massive impact um you know, it's something that has been deeply meaningful for for myself and the team. Yeah. Uh, and a great learning experience, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it's so true. And I think that's most important, right? Like for you to feel like you've done all you could in the time you've been given. I mean, everything else, I suppose, is really out of our control, right? So, yes. yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's a nice way to, to, to sum that up. I, I do have one final question that I ask all my guests, um, and that's a reflective one. Um, and that is, what life lesson has taken you the longest to learn? Oh, gosh. Um, uh, I'm currently working on one that... Um, it. It is what I'm, what I'm, what I'm, what I'm mulling over right now, uh, and this is something that has to do with my, my life, going back to my childhood and my early years. Is the concept of trauma versus karma, or trauma in the realm of karma? Um, and you know, looking at trauma. Um, because if you, like I mentioned earlier, if there was an incident and I looked at it through the lens of trauma, it becomes trauma that I carry, right? If that incident, I looked at it through the lens of karma, from a karmic perspective and understanding, you know, Buddhist perspective or whatever, then it becomes 
great, that's common. It's the end, it's the ripening end of a cycle of a seed that was planted and, and that just had to manifest so I can move on. And the, moving forward, that's done. It's the end of a karmic cycle, right? So then that's a positive, right? Yeah. But at the same time, trauma does certain things to the body, right? And it, it holds in the body. So what I'm, what a lesson that I'm working through right now is, um, learning to to address um, some of the issues that I felt when I was younger that I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm strong, I'm over it, just get up and carry on, you know? Yeah. Um, so now I'm, I'm starting to feel in a place where I'm safe enough to look back at those, at those issues, um, again, with that lens of karma and look at how maybe it's held in my body somewhere or maybe it affects the way that I make decisions in my life. Um, even though I feel like I've done well, um, um, I've done well, all things considered, given everything that I've been through, I'm pretty lucky. That's, that's generally how I look at it, right? Uh, and I am. I am. I am deeply, deeply grateful for where I am and that I'm still alive. Um, but there are, are things that I think um, all of us um, can take the time to be more compassionate with ourselves, to help to heal and, and, and be um, like the best versions of ourselves. Yeah. Oh, what a what a lovely way to end it off. Um, bef before I let you go, um, how can people find out more about We the Good and and, and the work that you guys are doing? Um, we have our website, which is we the good .sg. Um, On that website, we um, we have the charities that we're supporting and a page for resources. So if anyone needs help, uh, the help is there. Um, do follow us on Instagram and share our posts. Um, a lot of the work that we're doing, to be honest, um, so far has been behind the scenes. Um, and we haven't really posted much about, you know, different things that we're doing because I'd like to see them fully running uh and and um and sort of being successful rather than just sort of talking about stuff that we're starting and then they might disappear <laughs> <laughs> so um yeah it, we have some exciting stuff coming up uh with some champions that we're bringing on board so basically what we do is we have um well-known individuals who have platforms and, and reach and influence who will come on board and talk about these things we have a, a technology arm which is different to other people who engage uh, well-known individuals who measure the influence to impact um so there's a whole analytics and technology sort of back end to what we're doing yeah. um which will be useful uh down the line um so yeah there's exciting things happening so just stay tuned, be supportive. Uh, when there's, there's, there's opportunities to help, um, please do. And most importantly is just learn about your world, learn about your community, understand that there are people who are really suffering right now, even though you may not see them, and know that giving doesn't mean money. Uh, giving can be experience. Giving can be skill sets. Giving can be time. Giving can just be an ear listening uh, and learning um, and just being an active, engaged, supportive community member. Awesome. That's a great way to end. <laughs> well, <laughs> Nadia, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to really discuss this. I hope people have uh, learned something from your experience and, and to realize that, you know, it's just because the world is bleak doesn't mean we stop doing the things we can do to influence it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, and uh, maybe we'll maybe we'll chat again when 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 all these things come to fruition. Yes, awesome. that would be nice. Awesome. Have a beautiful week. You too. Okay.